Welcome everyone to this month's D2 Investment Webinar. This is your host and Certified Master Coach John Randall with us as always. We have our D2 Investment Guru and uh, best political impersonator, Mr. Drew Watson. So Drew, we've had um, a little, uh, little reprieve in the markets here into this week. So uh, what's the latest? What's going on with um, uh, the markets, the economy, the Fed? What's the latest from your, your perspective? Well, from the seat where I am today, John, it looks like what's happening is we are getting a reprieve. I think the volatility that's been out there has probably driven a lot of clients a little bit batty. Uh, it's probably scared a lot of people. You know, volatility had kind of disappeared from the scene uh, until the end of last year, uh, the back half of 2015, it re-entered. And I think that a lot of that has to do with, you know, the Fed. Uh, they, they cut the QE program. <clears throat> They've made numerous mention that they were going to begin raising interest rates, as well as <clears throat> they kept saying they would raise rates four times in 2016. So, you know, with that said, you know, that put a lot of pressure on the U.S. dollar. From the standpoint, uh, you know, the dollar had a lot of dollar strength going. And so, without a doubt, that, in a roundabout way, put pressure on any commodities that are priced in dollars. Uh, the biggest culprit in that uh, bailiwick, without a doubt, was uh, crude oil. And any commodity that's priced in dollars, you know, even if demand is the same and the dollar goes up, the price of the commodity is going to fall correspondingly. And that's what happened with oil. And I think towards the end of last year and into this year, you've had a very highly correlated trade between U.S. equities and oil prices. Now, what's strange about that is, is historically, there's not that much correlation. And I think, uh, you know, more to bring it down to client terms is if you had a list of 20 stocks, uh, you know, kind of like in the moderate dividend growth portfolio or some of the other more diversified portfolios, probably cheap oil is good for 80, 85% of them, maybe even more depending on what you own. So that's a discussion to have with the clients because I think clients, they get scared, but but at the end of the day, you know, what happens is, is, is you know, we know what's going on with their portfolios and we need to be more uh, ready to step into the breach, as it were, to say, hey, you know, let's look at this, take the emotion out of it, and, you know, surely to goodness, $26 oil is better for, you know, Dollar General or, or name the companies than $100 oil. And I think clients will we'll get the message. So, in essence, you know, we've had a highly correlated trade with oil. Uh, you've had people that are very scared, very concerned, given what's going on in the market. And, you know, as of this morning, I think S&P was down, or yesterday, S&P was down about 8.5% year to date. We've kind of bounced off those lows. We'll go through some charts in a minute. But, uh, you know, from what I see, I kind of like that, you know, for a couple days in a row, we finished at strength. Today, we're a little bit off our highs, but, you know, for the third day, uh, you know, we've continued to kind of pound it out. And I think the Fed minutes that were released shows a group of individuals that, you know, at least on paper, looks like they're probably second-guessing having, you know, four interest rates, quote-unquote, baked into the cake. So we'll get a little bit of a reprieve there. Uh, interest rates are down. If you've got clients that have been looking to refinance or purchase a home, mortgage rates, you know, it's fantastic deals. Now, last week, truthfully, it was probably a little bit better, but I think the 10-year is still under 2%. We we're at, what, 183 today on the 10-year. That's a pretty uh, attractive-looking piece to be in. Now, conversely, and I don't have to tell anybody on this call that owns Ameriprise stock, but financials have been kind of taking it on the brunt here lately um, because I, I think the the – saving grace that was supposed to come into the financials were going to be a rising rate environment. They can make more money. 
Uh, part of the narrative of the meltdown two weeks ago, European bank concerns, um, and and that bled into the U.S. I would say, and there again, John, I'm a kind of an optimist, but let's be real. The the situation with some of these banks is if rates don't go up, you know, their earnings. I'm not saying they're going to lose money or or fail, but what they can earn is going to be capped, especially if we have another Democratic president. Dodd-Frank legislation, uh, you know, limited what fees could be charged and overdrafts. Uh, you know, so if I keep writing bad checks all over town, uh, you know, they can't charge me as many fees. That was a wink there. Donald Trump uh, frowned. Uh, they've got higher expenses in how they have to do their appraisals now. And their best customers, as we just discussed, are locking in lower interest rates for longer periods of, of time. The third leg of their money-making operation besides loans and fees was their balance sheet. And if the bonds are rolling off their balance sheet to lower reinvestment rates, that's going to spell trouble for a lot of your banks. And you know, Oppenheimer has a phenomenal piece with what their thoughts are on the election and probably the five key issues um, that are going to be addressed there. Grant, we can get John that piece to send out. But, you know, it was Obamacare, defense, uh, entitlement reform, that's when there was something else. But, but basically, uh, you know, this Dodd-Frank deal, if there's not any um, – repair to that, it's going to be a very difficult time for U.S. banks to make money, uh, and especially the kind of money that they were making before. But I think, John, what I've discussed with, with my clients is I think you want to, you know, if you have clients that are really scared, I think, you know, you start the conversation, you want to be reassuring, but I think it's okay, too. Let's say, let's just face, let's face what might be the worst case head on. And, uh, I'm going to share the screen now, John. I'm going to share the screen now, John. Uh, in probably short order, I'll be <clears throat> sharing the screen. Uh, go ahead and hit that. More? Okay, we're going, to, we're going to do Thompson one. Okay, so so John, what we're going to be looking at here is uh, let's look at um, Thompson. Uh, I'm going to the home page. Well, Grant's home page is different than mine. Uh, where's Marketplace, Grant? I'm yours. Market overview. Okay, so so what this is what I look at, John, in the mornings, and, and sometimes you know, I'll even go over with clients. Is let's look at the let's survey the world. So the worst case scenario is, oh my gosh, we're going to go into a recession. I mean, I think everybody on the call has probably had clients ask them that. Uh, if you read any of the financial uh, press that's out there or, or watch CNBC on TV, that's what the doomsayers are saying. Well, here's what we know. You could have a recession, but if you follow my cursor, unleaded gasoline is a dollar a gallon wholesale. Okay. The savings that we've you know enjoyed over the last year and a half on this decline in unleaded gasoline prices, about forty percent of that has been saved or used to pay down debt. If you remember uh, we had I think in uh, September or October we had that fidelity data. U.S. personal borrowings are at levels that we haven't seen since the year 2000. And you've got unemployment at roughly under 5%. So my thought is, if the worst case is on the table and we go into a recession, it's hard for me to imagine the recession could be that difficult with all those factors. Uh, sure, we could have some exogenous uh, action take place that really uh, shakes things up. 
But under the current setup that we have, John, I would find it to be difficult that we would have a very severe recession. The truth is, uh, like everybody's joked about their grandparents coming through the Depression, uh, they don't want to spend money. I think this great recession has left a mark on people. And to this, you know, let's call it seven, eight years post the recession, people are showing they are very uh, shy about getting back to their profligate spending. That got a lot of people in trouble. So with these low debt levels, higher levels of savings, lower food and energy costs, it's difficult for me to imagine, and with an unemployment rate under 5%, that any recession we would get into would be a very, you know, uh, dastardly recession. So that's kind of the key. As I see, you know, the market scenario, really what we're looking at here is the S&P 500. Um, you know, we had this bottoming out here, 12 months. We're kind of starting to dig our way uh, out of that morass. We had a different chart. Um, let's see, what's the main screen, Grant? Yeah, so we have the SPY, you know, this is the S&P 500 loaded up, John, look on the right axis here, is we've had four up days in a row. We finished its strength on two of them. That's what these two charts are. We finished just a tad off. 1960 is the 15-day moving average. If we get over that on the S&P 500, I think we got a little bit of a kind of clear steaming ahead. The deal with oil, it appears, is that nobody, people were guessing what Chinese oil usage was. And, and I don't know if anybody on this call was on the Franklin Square call that they did last week. Um, it was a fantastic call. Uh, not so much, you know, it's about their product, yes, but their depth of knowledge of the balance sheet of some of these energy companies was very, very refreshing. And they were the first guys to really say, hey, you know, our guys in the field that do energy year in, year out for their, their living, saying Chinese consumption is not off the map. Sure enough, later that night and into Friday morning, China released their oil usage numbers. John, I mean, held her up. And it's kind of one of those deals, think of it this way. China has the world's largest population. Also, when you see a picture of Beijing, China, John, what does everybody have on their face? Maybe it's called a mask. And because they can't breathe. They can't breathe because there's pollution. Why is there pollution? Well, every car that can get out of the U.S. is put on a freighter, sent to the Far East, and people are buying our old junkers. And John, the old 1993 Honda Accord beater doesn't get as good mileage as the 2014 Honda Accord. So the Chinese are buying, you know, they're buying new cars too, but by and large, they're rank and file populace, can't afford those. They're buying older cars from other parts of the developed world. And guess what? They like to drive. So, it's now the common sense is, well, hell, their gasoline usage is probably going to go up year after year the more they buy vehicles. So I think we've got a reprieve here, John, that's going to last. Hopefully, it won't be every day, it won't be like this. But hopefully, we've got about a month run, very similar to what we had in the fall that's showing up here um, in this part of the chart. And I think if we kind of cross over, break through some resistance, I think we have some pretty good sledding ahead. Uh, and, and those are the discussions I've been having with my clients uh, because they, you know everybody's concerned about what's happened. But I think it's our job to kind of put it into some common sense approach. Like the Chinese, you know, they want to drive to their oil usage is going up. And the thing with the oil patch, let's not forget, 
there, even though we have a lot of oil, eventually in some oil wells, what happens to the oil? It runs out. And amazingly enough, about 5% of world supply runs out every year. So uh, the world is a little bit oversupplied right now. There's no doubt about it. But, but also, you know, we burn through a lot of it. I would close with this as it concerning energy. There's been a lot of talk, and your clients cannot really get away from it about Iran. And Iran's going to come back into the market, and they're going to flood the market. Well, the fact that they kind of made their comments today, they're getting on board with the Saudis and the Russians. The key thing about Iran to keep in mind is they need about $300 billion worth of infrastructure improvements just to get caught up to the rest of the Middle East. This is not getting caught up to the U.S. This is just getting caught up to Iraq, who has lost all their northern production due to uh, ISIS. Uh, this is just to get back to what I would consider 20th century production techniques. Now, to put that in perspective, John, uh, total U.S. CapEx spending in the energy patch at its high was $90 billion. So the Iranians are going to have a multi-year, probably half a decade building, because one, they've got to attract, attract this capital to come in. That's not going to be easy to do, because most people on Earth remember what happened to the Shah of Iran, you know, 30 years ago. Remember John, tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree, bring the, bring the hostages home. And given the level of volatility in the Middle East, it's going to be hard to attract that level of investment to come in to get their oil fields up to speed to where they should have been 15 years ago. So I, I would say, you know, basically what we have is, is an opportunity uh, to think that you might see energy prices go up here in the near term. And maybe some of this drawdown in price was a little bit of overreaction. And I think, you know, Ted Truscott, his words are great. You know, it's never as bad at the bottom as people fear, and it's never as good at the top as people fantasize. You know, the world is always kind of somewhere in the middle, and I think we'll revert to the mean a little bit, and, and, and we'll go forward with that. So that's kind of the market volatility update, John. Nice. Very good. As we go here, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and post at the bottom. Just be sure you send it to everyone so everyone can see your question. Uh, where it says sent to, you just have to change it from uh, just sending it to the host, um, which is basically Jacqueline. Uh, it's basically changing it so uh, everyone can see your question so, uh, so we all see it. So um, uh, I know we've we got a, an action-packed agenda. We've got uh, individual securities we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about fixed income. We're just going to do a quick, timely update on the uh, the REIT repricing, which is coming in April. We just want to make sure that uh, everyone had a plenty of, of launch ramp to get ready for that. Um, so before we flip over to uh, individual securities, you know, Drew, the um, you know, Ameriprise is doing a lot of communications on the uh, Department of Labor. You know, they basically have been uh, no one knows anything, but. Um, uh, any insights there for advisors on uh, just what to expect or what to prepare for with the uh, Department of Labor and fiduciary rulings coming out later this year? Well, I think, you know, we're, we're at a period of time where, uh, you know, you're going to hear probably a lot of inflammatory speech. It, you know, anytime you deal with politicians, all you have to do is turn your television on and listen to me. I mean, Ted, about that, or, or Senator Sanders. Uh, so, so keep in mind... When it's coming from politicians, it's, it's going to be – it's meant for the mass public, and it's meant for dramatic effect. So let's keep that in mind. And probably, depending on what is initially proposed, won't be the final regulations on this, hopefully. Uh, there's going to be a replay of the call that they're doing today at 3.30 Central. Everybody can kind of get on. But I think what you're going to see is Ameriprise is probably way out ahead of this compared to most broker-dealers, because 
we have been focused on providing advice rather than products. And I think the differentiation, John, is going to be what is advice-driven versus what is product-driven. And the more you can focus on advice and providing value to your clients in that format, the less of an impact this will potentially have on you. I will say this, this is also legislation that, that I think you know probably the election might have uh, a role in as well. Um, I think this is probably a standard overreach by the Department of Labor. It's a you know regime that sees a lot of its uh, grip slipping away in the American workplace. Uh, you know we've become less unionized, more right to work state oriented over the last 15 to 20 years. And I think probably at the end of the day, this may just be the Department of Labor wanting to ensure its own continuity and its succession plan. That they know if they can kind of open up this can of worms, get into this bailiwick, they're gonna assure tens of thousands of bureaucrats jobs for the future. Um, maybe I should be on Fox News. <laughs> Not dramatic and uh, uh, insane enough, but it's it's very good insight. Uh, I know uh, Travis Chain and I have been talking a lot the last couple of months about uh, being ahead of this as well. So um, as we hear more, we may even have a uh, special one of these webinars, but we'll certainly include these as we hear more. And uh, but Drew's right on. If uh, if your business and practice is focused on advice more so than products, then uh, uh, I think you put it best. This, this is, could essentially be a, a non-event. So uh, let, let's let's dive into um, uh, one of the more exciting areas that uh, I think it, it advisors delve into with individual security. So we saw last month in Drew's lineup, he uses uh, four different stock portfolios that he pulls from, and uh, two of them from Ameriprise, two of them from S&P that, that uh, not too long ago we had to pay for to access. So um, the, uh, the portfolios themselves are a great place to pull from because someone else is already doing the research. Ameriprise is doing the research. S&P is doing the research. You don't have to spend days and days uh, grueling through stock reports to come up with uh, your own rating like an analyst. So, um, so Drew, let, let's talk about uh, – individual securities at a high level, what clients you use them with, um, how you're using these lists, and, uh, and maybe how you position what you, you talk about when it comes to the client conversation. Well, I think, John, and, and I pulled up some of the uh, stuff that, that, that we use, and you're right, we use four portfolios to pay on the client situation. Hopefully that's coming across the wire. Uh, <clears throat> we're having some teletype problems. Uh, well, I'll go back to this. Is that Thompson on? Uh, so basically, we use either the um, Standard & Poor's total return portfolio, their high-quality uh, capital appreciation portfolio, IRJ, IRG, sorry, uh, strategic income opportunity, or the moderate dividend and growth. Where we found clients are most attracted to individual securities is your higher net worth space. Uh, and I think also, you know, if you're going to be going against a cost-conscious competitor, maybe like Vanguard, T. Rowe, something like that, uh, individual securities definitely have a, a place in the portfolio. Another piece of the portfolio that we'll, that we'll do, if you have, a, you know, a client has a large enough position to be able to do it, is just basically a small equal weight S&P 500, basically S&P 50. So it takes the top 50 stocks. Uh, out of the S&P 500, do an equal weight, set your model up to rebalance, and you get pretty much grant most of the performance uh, at, at really kind of a very, very cost, a point you can compete with anybody uh, from that standpoint. So individual securities, I think, really resonate with your higher net worth clients. Most of them, if they're going to ACAT their business in, that's probably what they've been using through either an SMA or some other type of strategy, and they feel comfortable using them. Because one, John, really the uh, transparency is fantastic. And 
given the volatility that we've had, it was really easy today. I mean, things are bad. I mean, but, you know, you pull up somebody's account, and they see they've got Chevron and Disney, uh, <clears throat> Apple Computer, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson. You know, those examples, <clears throat> it's pretty easy to say, hey, you know, uh, we're going to um, – Dollar cost average into Disney here because, and I'm pulling you know the chart up. It's down, you know. It's kind of broken out. We think this is a good use of your dollars. They're familiar with the company, you know. They may want to know what's happened, but but basically, either on a discretionary platform on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the transparency of knowing what you're investing in is a very, very, very important not only selling tool but I would say keeping tool. Um, because even when things are bad, if you've got a position, I mean, Kendra Morgan, let's be honest, that was in the model for a long time. We've got a lot of that stock. But I have pretty good news. Stock was up about 10% today, roughly. Uh, you know, people kind of see the jump. People that are in the energy business realize they have too many assets to go away. You know, what are we going to do there? But being able to see that on the statement, on the PMT, and have a plan I think, too, your clients realize you're doing something for you. You know, let's kind of cost average into this and see where we're going to end up on the individual security side. Um, the key of using either the S&P information or the IRG information is those guys are doing all the fundamental analysis for us. You know, we really don't have to get into the minutia of the balance sheet on some of these energy companies. You know, we don't have to get into the minutia on some of the, you know, the debt ratings, et cetera. You can if you want, sure, but by utilizing the portfolio that they have, and these are all tried and true portfolios that go back, uh, I think, to 2004, in some cases even earlier, uh, you know, you've got a pretty longer-term track record that you can use. And depending on, you know, how much or how little of these you want to use, and you can add it to basically be a satellite approach to somebody else's portfolio and just use that as kind of the short list that you utilize to, for your stock selection. So, you know, what we found is on the S&P side, they're pretty good across the board. Uh, you know, if they take something out of one portfolio and it happens to be in another one, you know, it's going to be removed. They have found, I think, some pretty good ways to invest in the consumer staples market in that High quality capital appreciation model, you know, WD40 has been a home run. There again, it's transparent. Everybody's heard of it. They should be making all kinds of money. Their main ingredient is oil. Oil is at 30 bucks. You know, uh, that's a pretty good deal for them. So, so basically, you know, we'll go through there, use them as whole portfolios, or if we have situations where we need to get a sector play. For another portfolio, depending if the client wants, you know, income or growth, and you know, we'll use some stocks out of either one of those. Um, you know, so the IRG portfolios have been great. The S and P portfolios have been, have been pretty good as well. So you know, that's what we focus on. You know, the issue I think too comes up, John, in the securities. People say, well, why did not I? You know, this is not done as well. You know, really, value's been a little bit out of favor. And if you look at clients that needed more income. The last year and a half has been hard on them because a lot of that income is coming from the energy patch. You know, we've been, you know, that energy patch has been hit, so we've had to look at other areas that could benefit from cheaper oil if this persists. And so, you know, therefore we might look at some consumer discretionary names, consumer staples, et cetera, and now that's paying off for us. A quick uh, question in here, Drew. Um and, and Jack, and we should probably look at, at resending out Drew's investment spreadsheet from last month. But uh, Paige has a question here just around, um, are you going to share the portfolios in the individual ed equities that we're discussing? So um, we can get those out on that spreadsheet. But Drew, where, where do you access the, the IRG models and the S&P models? Well, the S&P models, I'm pulling them up right here off Thompson under research S&P market scope. Uh, and I apologize about the other. I've kind of been as a tech problem, John. But don't tell anybody; they won't notice. Uh, <laughs> under S&P portfolios, you press on that. 
high quality appreciation. Uh, it kind of shows when stuff is added. Here recently, Wells Fargo was added. You could tell uh, the end of January. Uh, TJ Maxx was in at the end of January. A.O. Smith went in uh, February 1st. This has been nuts. I mean, it's been a powerhouse. Uh, we bought it a little bit later, I think on the 4th. Uh, was that two bucks a day? We're up probably 8% on the position in a week. No, we bought it a week ago. Um, a lot of these names are very similar, if not identical, to what's in the IRG, uh, moderate dividend growth. I've done the back testing on this. The performance is pretty close. Uh, the yield on the uh, moderate dividend growth from IRG was, what, 25 basis points more? But the performance year over year, going back 10 years, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's pretty close. Now, you can see... Obviously, there's some things that are struggling here. Got a lot of financials, T. Rowe, Principal, Lazard. Um, so, you know, this is probably more financial heavy. Um, they're out of energy. They got rid of uh, Chevron. They've kept Exxon. They just went into that last year. Timing on that was excellent. Uh, Ford hasn't panned out so well, or GM. I think it's a longer term play. But um you know, same deal. Uh, what we were looking at, uh, Cisco had been on this list for a while, then it showed up on the IRG list. Um uh, and then we are looking at Coca Cola Enterprise and then um uh, yeah, so, so out of here, we're looking at Coca-Cola Enterprise as a staple that we like to add to get a little bit more of a bump because there again, it's kind of, you know, that the IRG list is almost exclusively large cap, so we thought that would give us some more diversification. That's kind of in our on-deck circle to add, so to speak. So, Drew, so, how, how do you plug these into portfolio? Do, do a lot of these replace? like your large cap holding, like an ETF, or they complement it? How, how do you typically use these for, for an account with over a million? Well, for over a million, I mean, it, it's going to be, you're going to probably use this as like the growth, whatever growth fund or ETF you would use. You might use the uh, moderate dividend growth for the value play. I mean, that, that that's typically how we have been um, using these as the engines in our portfolio. A lot of uh, questions advisors ask are, um, do you try and do a certain dollar amount uh, per stock? Do you have a minimum dollar amount per stock? Do you try and do any round lots in case you want to do options? Do you look at any of that when you're you're buying these? Yeah, the minimum we would say is eight grand. So if there's twelve stock, you know, you probably need to have a little bit more than hundred grand or right out a hundred thousand to use these. But about eight grand a stock, uh, and yes, on bigger portfolios, we'll try to round up. To get some option action. I will tell you a lot of the names on the S&P option list are what's been added to the high quality appreciation list. You know, A.L. Smith you'd see in there, uh, WD-40, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of crossover on the S&P uh, material that they use. But, but yes to both those questions. So with, um, with, with clients, one thing you've talked about in the past is, is with some clients a little more savvy, maybe understand the industry they work in. Um, you talked about letting them get involved in seeing these lists and maybe picking a company they know or, or sector they know. Do you get into much of that, or are you pretty much directing in, in like, SPS Advisor, here's what we're going to do, here's what we're going to recommend? Um, do you let clients get involved at any point? I mean, they can get involved, depending on the size of the account, would we'll determine that. Most of them we say, no, this is kind of what we're going to do. Uh, you know, we, we try to steer more people to the discretionary platform. It's easier for us. We think it's better for them. Uh, you know, like on the A.L. Smith deal, people that went in when we said have come out, you know, way better off uh, than people that didn't. You know, I, I would say this, um, you know, not everybody's perfect. I think if people are using the moderate dividend growth strategy, they went, we went into Microsoft, what, at 55? 
you know, we're still underwater in that trade. Cisco's worked out well. Uh, so, you know, I, I think you just kind of, you want, I prefer to have the discretion to be able to do it. Uh, you know, we're working to trade on our unleaded gasoline to try to, we lower the cost there. We lower the cost on some kinder, big kinder positions. Um, and now I think we're within reaching distance of kind of getting back to break even. Um, because it's difficult for a client to make the decision to go in after when they've lost money. Um, and I think it's human nature. Typically, people will uh, hold on to their losers too long, and they tend to jettison the winners too early. Um, and, and so, you know, we just have to have the discipline to be able to make that not happen. So let, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, maybe a large concentrated stock position a client may have. Um, I see on the uh, practice performance statements or uh, Bob detail reports, Boy, there's tons of assets sitting around in a lot of practices in individual stocks and in a brokerage account buys this as well. Client owns it. Um, they have a low cost basis. There's nothing I can do. What, what, Drew, what would you suggest? What can an advisor do on individual securities that maybe a client inherited or they have from work that's just sitting around? What's some strategies that uh, advisors could deploy for those clients? Well, I think you have to ask a lot of questions, John, and because, you know, usually the truth is, you know, a little bit different than what the initial uh, kind of brush off they may have given you. Uh, I think you get, you got to you know, is, was it grandfather's favorite stock? Was it the company where they made their money? What is the attachment to the position? And I think once you know what the attachment is, then you can go a little bit deeper with them. So that's number one. So secondly, kind of once you find out the attachment, uh, I think then you need to try to talk a little bit of reason to them. If it was sentimental attachment, it's fine to keep some, but I think if you can show them a compelling case that you might be able to uh, put some other positions with it that has historically done well when um, you know these types of positions have done poorly, you're going to add value. Perfect example. I mean, let's let's talk about it. Talk about Exxon. You know, a lot of people have Exxon because their granddad had it. And, oh, you know, it'll always come back. You know, um, the example is, you know, show them, well, what if we sold this thing at 95 bucks, bought some other things? You know, typically your consumer discretionary names are going to trade opposite of energy. Um, and so what if we took some of the Exxon and went to a diversified por portfolio of some consumer names? Uh, then say, look, we're not opposed to buying it. When Exxon, you know, hit the skids, maybe got under 70 bucks. Look, we're going to buy some more shares of it because this could be your addition to your grandfather's legacy and give it to your kids. So I think if there's emotional attachment because it's a family asset, that's, that's the way we've handled it. And typically it's work. Uh, when it's a work attachment, you know, I think the easiest story to tell is let's look at General Electric. Uh, you know, for for, Gen for GE, GE was the best stock in the world for a long time. And, and oh, it's his computer. I got so many computers going on here, John, I'm high tech. So, you know, we'll go out here. Here's a 20-year chart of GE. Um, I can't tell what this number is because of the, the screen's there, but it's probably 60 some odd dollars. Okay, yeah. so 90, 90 bucks. So you get all these GE people, their cost basis is five. It got to 90. You know, it was back at five and 09. Well, everything came back up, but, but look at this. So the position is, you know, whatever stock it is, say, okay, so let's say these guys that worked at GE and women felt like GE was a juggernaut. Jack Welch was there. Um, he did awesome, blah, 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 blah. It makes perfect sense to take some of the money off the table because, one, I think what we've seen even with Apple and GE, no matter how large the company is, 
if you've really had kind of a once in a generation CEO, you're going to have a drop off in performance at some point. Uh, you know, the good to great books, uh, business management books, tell that tale. Uh, two, if your job is tied to it, if heaven forbid something happened to the company, you know, you're going to be in double trouble because you've got all your capital stuck in there. And if you really believe that the company's great, diversify because if that rainy day comes and for some reason you can buy the stock back at five bucks a share, you have another shot to make six times your money again. So, you know, that's that that's the you know, paying the tax man is not the worst thing in the world because that's a lot of times that's the you know objection is oh I gotta pay tax on that. Well, yes. But but relatively speaking, if you're dealing with higher net worth people, their capital gains rate is going to be the lowest rate they would pay. So that's typically what we see. All right. Well, let, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about uh, fixed income. And Drew, you've yeah, always well, said that the, uh, the the path to uh, uh, your larger clients, your larger net worth folks, is uh, is through fixed income. Yeah, let's talk about that because there is a lot of value in fixed income. Golly, I'm a bonehead. Uh, I keep pressing the wrong keyboard, John. They've confused me. They're going to take Dad's car keys away tonight. <laughs> uh, so, so basically what we have here, if you haven't been on the fixed income trading site, that, that this is what, where we are. So, you know, this is easy for us because, you know, we're, we're in Kentucky, and this is kind of a Kentucky thing. And this is not a recommendation to buy anything, but this is an example. So what you have here is Marathon Oil, okay? Marathon Oil has kind of a debt to uh, asset ratio of about 19%, which in the energy business is not terrible. You've got bonds are going to be maturing in roughly a year and seven months, roughly. 6% um, coupon, you're able to buy them at a deep discount. Yield the worst is about eight, probably eight and a quarter, let's call it that. So, so now, there again, we are not saying, hey, do this, but if you can kind of put some of these opportunities under the noses where it's appropriate, where it's suitable for your client, that's not a bad deal. And what we found is depending on, you know, you've got to know what your clients like. And if they don't mind being in energy, you know, there's value. That when there's blood in the water, as uh, Meyer Rothschild said, you know, you want to buy when there's blood in the streets. In a lot of these sectors, there is blood in the streets. So given that, uh, you know, you can kind of look through different areas or, you know, if there's a bigger employer in town, you know, and, and I would, you know, what we've done in our case is for people where it's attractive and it makes sense suitability-wise, because uh, we really don't have any junk bonds in the book anymore, do we, Grant? You know, we're, we clean that all up. It's all investment grade, high, you know. This is a little yield booster. So that's the type of example for a fixed income idea you could come up with to say, okay, you know, here's what we've got. The other thing we've done probably more with fixed income here lately is go to the term trust um, and use, golly, did it again. Uh, use a trust, you know, in this case, this is BlackRock Taxable uh, Muni Bond Trust. You're looking at 2020 maturity on this one. Um, you know, it's levered, 7% yield. But also, it's going to go out in about four, eh, four years and two or three months uh, at NAV. I think it's trading at probably just a small discount now, Grant. Correct. Uh, <clears throat> so it'll true up to probably around twenty-two fifty a share. I think the NAV. The yield's going to drop off. But basically, by having individual fixed income, John, people are going to know what it's going to be worth at maturity. Yeah. Which is a whole, whole lot better opportunity than just being in kind of a bond fund 
and say, well, man, we start with 100,000. It's 96. We really don't know where it's going to end up. Uh, now, because on the term trust, you've got daily liquidity on this too. So this is kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, we use NBB as well on the taxable side. Um, you know, it's got an attractive yield of about 6, 6.4. JLS, these are kind of some bigger mortgages. Uh, there again, and you can see there's a little bit of volatility here, um, but it's trading all within a, you know, pretty tight range. Um, decent yield, and this is going to be a 2019 maturity. And right now, you know, hit a low today, 21.93. Um, it's trading. You know, I think the discount here is probably seven to eight percent. I think Grant. Um, so you know, we, so so for fixed income, we've tried to go on step up in credit quality, try to get everything or most of the stuff have a maturity on it, and and basically lead the way with that, so the clients know, you know, when is the money kind of coming in their pocket. And I'll tell you, I mean, if you've got a few minutes in the office every day, go to that fixed income trading thing. I mean, because you know, you can just kind of put in a symbol and say, okay, what what's the debt? Because the other thing too is, I'm not putting an amp. I don't know, John, throw me out of company. Uh, oh, here we go. You know, you can get a, you can get an idea about what people think about the company more so by looking at this and the stock price. You know, here's our. <clears throat> Basically, three-year bond. I mean, it's one fifteen. <clears throat> that tells me you know we're pretty well thought of. Um, nothing kind of trading at a discount. So, uh, you know, that's you might find some deals there for your clients. You might also find out kind of how strong you know some of the companies you're dealing with are as well. And I think that's important on the financial side. Because, Mr. Do you try and find some shorter term things um, so there's more certainty on you know, whether it's two years, three years, five years of uh, uh, at least what the client's going to get back on their the principal? Is, is that a key component when you're looking up the um, uh, these different bonds more so than the yield? Absolutely, because that's what wealthy clients want. They want return of principal, not so much yield. And I, I would say, you know, we talked about financials, John, not performing. I pulled up with you know BB and T bond. You know, I think BB and T probably hit a 52 week low today, stock price wise. You know, you look at their debt. I mean, their debt is at par or above most of it. Um, so it tells you the market's really not pricing anything. So that that might be a thing on the equity side. You say, okay, what's the market telling you? Their bonds are trading at 10 points above par, stocks down 25 percent. That's a disconnect. Uh, so, you know, those are the things that we look for here at the office when we try to find opportunities. Nice stuff. That's pretty good. So uh, I, I think that, mm -hmm. um, you know, as we go, I, I find advisors have, have questions as we go about this. So uh, you may not have a question today, but this is a great thing to email us about. If you have a case you want us to check out that uh, maybe have a more conservative client, you're trying to put together some portfolio for them. You know, this is a great way to uh, create value and put something together like this in an SPS or SPS advisor account. It's true show that that one uh, Marathon Oil uh, bond paying uh, six percent uh, maturing in in uh, in 19 months. Hey, that that's a pretty good deal for clients that are stuck with their uh, you know one and a half percent three year CD. Or uh, you know other things out there they're trying to do. You can create a lot of value uh, with a lot more certainty with some of these shorter term bonds. It's a great thing. So email us, email me and Drew. We'll we'll uh, uh, we'll help you out with this. We'll uh, we'll use them as case studies, and you'll basically get a lot of free support, a lot of free um, education advice on what to uh, be bringing to your client. So uh, really great stuff there. A lot of great deals out there. And uh, I love Drew's idea. Look for some local employers. Um, it'll be more relevant to the client. The client will uh, will understand it if they can relate to a strong company that they know locally. There's a lot of certainty. It's not some obscure municipality in a state far, far away. You know, it's pretty uh, uh, pretty relatable. Pretty easy for that conservative, very wealthy client. And as Drew said, return of principle is most important. 
don't go yield hunting. Um, probably the higher the yield, the higher the risk. So uh, uh, look for those shorter maturities, and um, there'll be a lot of certainty there as far as what you're buying for and what you're um, uh, making sure the client gets back in, in principle. So uh, any last things on fixed income, Drew, before we cross over into uh, REITs and BDCs? No, no, no. I, I think we covered it all. Okay. <laughs> so uh, so real quick, let, let's jump into uh, REITs and BDCs. You know, a lot of this has been overshadowed. Um, uh, in, I think in the last month or so with the Department of Labor, um, you may have seen some communications about this December, January. Uh, Ameriprise was putting out a lot of things that the uh, pricing for some of your REITs and BDCs will be changing significantly on client statements. So this is not an Ameriprise change. This is an industry change. So um, this is really something that, um, you know, we're seeing uh, – uh, uh, that FINRA, all companies are, are having to deal with. So um, I, I got some great um, uh, insights from my team. You know, this is kind of a mystery to me, which clients are going to be affected, which ones aren't. For the most part, it's, it's going to be a small group of clients that are impacted, but they will be impacted uh, pretty significantly. So um, let me bring up a couple of the Ameriprise documents. Um, let's see here. All right, can we see that on there? Jacqueline, can we see that? All right, we're working to get that up there for you. Um, here we go. I'm just going to share my full screen. We'll pull this up. There we go. So this is the document put out by Ameriprise. So basically... When our clients bought REITs, they bought BDCs. They got a generic $10 per share phantom price that they owned. Uh, and it showed it on their statement until the end when it got priced, which is typically right before the, it either went public or uh, it got bought by somebody else, basically when there was a liquidity event for the client. So uh, what, what Fenris said is that's not really fair because it's not really worth $10 a share. The client paid a big commission. That's what pays you when you get uh, 5%, 7%. Some of these REITs and BDCs, the client's paying for that. Plus, the company is taking, taking another 3 4% on top of that. So um, there's quite a bit of commission that's actually happening. Now, over the course of the REIT, most of the time it works out pretty well that the client um, ends up getting a little bit better than $10. With a lot of your more conservative companies, your uh, WP Carry, uh, maybe your um, uh, Dividend Capital has been, been a great one recently. Um, you'll find that uh, to be the case. But uh, so basically, what what the the two groups of of REITs that are out there uh, really comes down to this. I'm going to bring up the second um, PDF here that that really helped me understand this. So if you have uh, a REIT out there, let's say it's an old, uh, uh, let's say you got a WP Carry, one of their CPA uh, uh, products, I think CPA 16, 17, maybe 18 are out there. They got some watermarks. In March, WP Carry is repricing all of their uh, REITs, so there will be an official NAV that's not the phantom $10 a share. If the REIT that your client owns has been actually priced, there will be no difference on the client statement. So in these two examples here, um, this bottom one, this XYZ REIT, shows $9 was the, uh, uh, basically the, the NAV that was priced. Um, right now, it shows $9. If it's already been priced that, going forward, it's still going to show $9. So a lot of your clients that have had REITs for probably more than a year um, they've probably already been priced. A lot of them are pricing annually now, some every 18 months. So the ones that you're holding from the past, there'll be no change on client accounts. So nothing to worry about for those folks. It's the newer ones that have been purchased in the last year or last 18 months that still have that phantom $10 per share. Those are the ones that are going to show a big difference. So check out the example here at the top, ABC Recorporation. Right now it shows that phantom $10 a share. So what's going to happen, 
starting in April, in just a couple of months, clients are going to see the real price after the commission they paid, after the amount the company took, and um, you know, basically they take they have two pieces of the pie that that they take. So um, in a lot of cases, it's about 12% that the REIT company is taking up front in the traditional kind of A share of REITs that we were only available for a long, long time, same with BDCs. So uh, that's the clients that you've got to prepare and worry about. Um, in the new uh, T shares that have become available, where it's, it's more like a C share mutual fund, the client pays a much smaller commission up front. Um, for the advisor, there's a, a much smaller, you know, upfront pay. There's a much uh, a bigger trail. Uh, most REITs are priced out. You get about 1% a year on them. Uh, BDCs are working on coming out with those. So uh, for those, you, you're going to see about uh, 6%, you know, 55 on some of them, 6% drop in the uh, uh, what that phantom $10 per share is and what the actual dollar amount that the client owns is. So for a lot of those... Um, I know we have some folks in um, uh, the newest dividend capital REIT. I know that one's not uh, going to reprice until June, halfway through the year. So for those particular clients, they're going to see a drop from $10 a share to about eight eighty a share. And then all of a sudden what we'll see is uh, uh, in April um, that big change is going to take place on their statement. So preparing those clients is going to be very important. And for the month of March, you may, may want to be doing that. Um, we're taking a couple different approaches here. We are doing a conference call just to let clients, targeted clients know that own those that are going to be affected just to get the word out. Uh, we're making sure that we're doing individual phone calls to those people. And they're not just me. My team helps out with those. It's pretty quick. Just giving them a heads up that um, their investment's okay. This is the way it's always worked. They'll still probably get more than they put in, plus they're earning a really nice dividend. It's just uh, FINRA and Ameriprise are pulling the curtain back, creating more transparency, word that, that Drew used, which is something that investors want. There's just going to be more transparency in their investment, but it's still going to be fine. Um, that's the word we need to get out in your individual meetings with clients. If you are seeing those targeted people in the month of March, be sure you're talking to them about it. So uh, uh, not a big deal. Uh, it's not a huge change because these are a small portion of, of clients' portfolios. But um, if any time they the clients see a loss, if you can head that off in the past and prevent them from worrying or saying, oh, my gosh, I just lost 12% of my REIT. What's going on? If you can prevent that, get ahead of that, uh, it'll be, um, gosh, a, a much better outcome than waiting for clients to get their statement then being upset. So be proactive. Reach out to those clients individually, hold an event, hold a, a, a phone conference or a webinar like this to educate people on what's going to happen. Just worry about the ones that do not have a true NAV on their REIT. Worry about the newer ones that have the phantom $10 price that are going to show you know, a 12% drop or 6% drop. Target those people, talk to them, get ahead of the wave, make sure they're not worried. So uh, I'm sure Ameriprise will have more stuff out here in the next month about that, but uh, we just wanted to get you ahead of the wave to make sure you prevent any of your best clients being really, really upset about our really, really small thing. So a uh, great webinar today. Um, I uh, was excited to get out uh, the old Ritz-Carlton book. We're excited. In about uh, six weeks, we'll be down in New Orleans. A lot of you signed up to come down and learn from the Ritz-Carlton. We're bringing them in uh, for the second time for Dynamic Directions uh, we have uh, learned from them. Actually, this will be our third time. We did it once in Orlando a long, long, long time ago. We did it in New Orleans probably about seven or eight years ago. So uh, we're excited to have them back. We're excited to be down there and uh, learn as much as we can from one of the greatest service organizations in the world. So uh, we'll be back on next month with some great, uh, uh, great items. Send us your cases for me and Drew. You'll get some free advice from your best clients. Send those out. And... Um, if you haven't registered for the uh, Ritz Carlton event, I think we're, we're pretty much full. There may be two or three spots left. So uh, jump on it if you want to attend. But uh, thank you, Drew, for being on. Thank you, Jacqueline, for your tech support. Thank you to all of you. Stay bullish. And uh, we'll see you all in uh, about six weeks down in New Orleans. Take care. <laughs>